We're going to look at two stories today of um, Jesus rolling into Jerusalem, all right? So, so he is not quite at Jerusalem yet, but, but these two stories are leading up to the pinnacle of history where Jesus dies on a cross for, for our sin, and a few days later, he rises from the dead. So right before Jerusalem, Jesus actually takes a little bit of a, a different route. Rather than through Samaria, he ends up going through Jericho, and he meets a few people on the way. So we're going to read two stories from uh, Jesus heading towards Jerusalem. But before I do that, I want to take the key verse from these stories, and I want to read it, and I'm going to talk about it for a minute. I want to take the key verse from not only these stories, but, but this verse may just summarize the gospel. This, story, this, this verse may show us who Jesus really is. Like if I had to pick a verse to tell somebody, what is this Christianity thing all about? I'm probably going to think about this one. And that is Luke 19.10. It says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man, he came to seek, but not only to seek, but to save those who were wandering in darkness, those who were lost and couldn't find their way. My friends, this is the gospel. This is our Jesus here. There is no other religion that offers this, no other moral code that offers this, no other lifestyle that offers this. A Savior who, who comes and, and seeks us out and then, and then saves us. Nothing else offers that. When I hear people, when I sit down with, with secular atheists and we begin to engage in conversations about, well, Christianity, what really is this? And, and I'll often hear this kind of universalistic idea of where all streams are flowing into one river, we're all going somewhere together, all religions are the same. That's just not true. It's not true on a, on a level of faith because Jesus says, I am the only way to the Father. But it's also not true just intellectually because Jesus made that claim, meaning that he is saying that is, there is one way, and that is me. I am the way, the truth. Me, number one. And I'll tell you what, every other religion, moral code, code lifestyle, it says go. It says look. It says find. It says earn. And then, you know what, once you do all of that with all your heart and you keep screwing up, you keep messing up, and then you go and you, you seek and you, you try more and more, then maybe, just maybe, by the skin of your teeth, you will make it to the place that you want to be. Everything else says something different than Christianity because in Christianity, grace is the difference maker because we Apart from every other thing that's offered in this world, we, believer, are sought after. Even if you're not a believer in here, you are being sought after by, by a Savior today, right now, by an infinite creator. Do we get that, church? Do we get that we have this Savior who, who seeks and saves? And I just want to put my cards on the table here for a moment. Because on my flight home on Friday, as I was sitting and, and writing some, some notes for this message, as I was considering what the Lord would have us talk about this weekend, you know, I thought about my own life. Now, sometimes my hope doesn't align with Jesus' sacrifice. Sometimes my hope doesn't align with the grace that Jesus really does provide. I don't think I'm alone there. Sometimes our hope doesn't align with the fact that Jesus seeks. Sometimes my hope doesn't align with the fact that, that Jesus saves. Sometimes my hope doesn't align with the fact that Jesus doesn't just save and then leave you, but he remains. Sometimes my hope doesn't align with the fact that Jesus not only seeks, saves, remains, but he allows us to flourish in him. When I read passages like this, sometimes I don't feel it. Sometimes I don't feel the truth of what is written down. 
You know what, church? Stories about Jesus' life, stories about Jesus' work, like we're about to read, we're about to read two stories from Jesus' life and work. These stories just aren't the good old days that we can look back on and hear about at church. They aren't talking about the days that are behind us. Because here's the thing, Jesus seeks and he saves today. He seeks and he saves today. In fact, he tells us, Jesus tells us in John 14, that it's better that he goes so that the helper, right, the helper, the Holy Spirit can come. Believer, we live in a day knowing full well, knowing full well because of of the written word, because God has revealed himself to us on paper. We know full well of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And that same power, the same power, the Holy Spirit of God that did all of that is alive in me and you. It's not old news. It's just not old news. In fact, there are people to be saved. And when it comes to us, there is unbelief in our hearts still to be eliminated. The mission continues. And God help us not to think that that the stories we read in the Word and these passages that we read are a fairy tale. Because these are true. And these are real. These, These are true for us. So these two stories we'll read today about Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, and Zacchaeus, they will affect us today. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you grew up in the church and heard these stories. I know If you grew up in the church, you definitely heard of Zacchaeus, right? You know the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Anybody? (laughs) Wee little man was he. He. You're all bad at singing, that's for sure. (laughs) My word. All right, that's why we've turned the volume up here loud so that (laughs) just the Lord hears, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So anyway, yeah, Zacchaeus, we've heard of him. All right, so let's go ahead and read these stories. I'll invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's word if you are able. Luke 18.35 is where we'll start, and we will shut down at our key verse, 19.10. As he drew near to Jericho, he's talking about Jesus, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. When he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Chapter 19. And he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Gotta love the Bible trying to be nice about this dude's short, all right? (laughs) He was small in stature. Verse four, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, and he was about to pass that way. And when, or excuse me, as he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Lord, we thank you for these stories. God, open our hearts to what you have for us today. Speak your life into us. Lord, Holy Spirit, be at work in our hearts. Teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. 
So our game plan for today, how we're going to break down these two stories, is we want to first look at Jesus. We want to look at Jesus and how he interacted in these two stories. But then we want to look at Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus. Okay, we're going to look at, at God first, and then we're going to look at, at, we're going to relate Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus to us and where we fall. So, so we're going to observe these things together. But let me just say, before we do that, I, I talked about this for a second earlier, but Jesus, there's no mistake that he is going through Jericho and he runs into do, these two guys. Like when it comes to the Lord, when it comes to these stories on these pages, we don't really believe in coincidence, right? The sovereign father is orchestrating Jesus' steps on earth. He is his son, right? Jesus is God himself and, and Jesus knows what is coming, he had to, we see back in Luke 9, you don't need to turn there, I'll just tell you about it. We see back in Luke 9 that on his way to Jerusalem, he was not able to go through Samaria, right? So he had to kind of divert, he went a different route and went through Jericho. So on his way to Jericho, he sees Bartimaeus, and then in Jericho, he sees Zacchaeus. So these meetings aren't a coincidence at all. Let's first talk about the things we see in Jesus first. Number one, we see that Jesus... He heals. Jesus heals Bartimaeus. As Jesus is walking, as the crowd is around Jesus, Bartimaeus being a blind man, whether he saw shapes and, and various shades of color, whatever it may have been, Bartimaeus is, is sitting there and, and he inquires, what, what's going on? What's happening? We see actually in Mark 10, because Bartimaeus is in all of the Gospels, we see in the Synoptic Gospels, we see in Mark 10 that they say to him, oh, Jesus, Jesus is coming through. And once Bartimaeus hears this, he begins to shout, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. He must have been on repeat, right? Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd sees Bartimaeus, and, and this hot shot's running through town here. Jesus is popular at this moment, right? He's going to be popular until he gets into Jerusalem. He'll be popular as he enters, but we all know what happens a few days later. So Jesus is, is walking through, and, and Bartimaeus is shouting in the crowd saying, Shut up! Be quiet! Quiet down! Tone it down! This is Jesus walking through. He doesn't want to hear from you. They're trying to get him to be quiet because Bartimaeus was nothing in that society, nothing in that culture. He was the, the scum of the earth in that culture. Nobody wanted, wanted anything to do with him. <clears throat> but then Jesus stops. Let's not miss this, this fact that he stops. He stops for for the one that no one loves, that no one regards as anything special. He stops and he asks, who said that, commands him to come. And you can imagine, let's not make this flowery, right? I tend to read, uh, every night Kaya and I will read some books together and we'll read Bible stories and, and Tell you what, these children's books are, are beautiful, but, but some of them are just, they make these stories to be so gorgeous. But we need to think about stinky, nasty Bartimaeus who lives on the side of the road, getting through people, blind, busting into people. Jesus tells him to come, and he's just voice strained, son of David, have mercy on me, going through the crowd. And Jesus asks him, what he wants, and Bartimaeus asked him to restore his sight. And imagine at that moment, after being blind for maybe a lifetime, but maybe a long period of time, whatever it may have been, opening your eyes to Jesus. At that moment, Jesus saying, your faith has made you well, and open your eyes and you see the Savior. It's amazing. Bartimaeus' bold confession of the Messiah and his humble belief in his power impressed Jesus, it seems. Jesus showed compassion. Jesus showed attention to detail. Because guess what? Jesus is 100% man, 100% God, right? 
you want to talk about that later, find somebody else to have coffee with, all right? I'm just kidding. But, but here's the thing. In his human nature, he didn't hear Bartimaeus. The crowd was freaking out because Jesus was rolling into town. But in his deity, being the God that he was, he knew Bartimaeus was there. And he sought after him. Bartimaeus was sought after and he was healed. Jesus heals. But number two, Jesus saves. Jesus saves those who are searching. And Jesus saves those who don't know they are searching. Get this. Jesus saves those who are searching. He saves the Bartimaeuses that say, Lord, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus responds in, in verse 42. He says, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. The direct translation of this is, I have saved you. This is the same thing he said to the woman who anointed his feet and the same thing he said to the woman who was sick with um, blood. In Luke 7 and 8, you can see that. But Bartimaeus acknowledges the Messiah and, and Jesus saves him right there on the spot. He, he knew he needed saving. The Holy Spirit was the one showing him he needed saving, but, but he knew he needed more. <clears throat> but Jesus doesn't stop there. He saves those who don't know they're searching too. God has chosen those who don't know they are searching too. Let's reread the keys of story, just the first six verses. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Verse 6. So he hurried and came down and humbled him joyfully, or excuse me, and received him joyfully. If you see this text, this is a narrative, right? So we need to enter into this. We need to, we need to really take a look at this and feel this. Something shifts here. Anybody who loves to read literature, right, narrative, like, like something changes here. You see Zacchaeus who doesn't know anything about this. He maybe has heard about Jesus, and, and he kind of climbs up into this tree, this rich man, and he's kind of looking. And then Jesus comes, and he stops, and all of a sudden Zacchaeus is excited. He hops down from the tree, and he hurries to Jesus. A second ago, he didn't know who he was. Something happens between verse 3 and verse 6 because unexpected grace smacks Zacchaeus right in the mouth up in that tree. He didn't even know as he was climbing up in that tree that the sovereign hand of God was stirring his curiosity and he was going to see the Christ who would save him moments later. This is the God we are dealing with. We see another example of this on, with Paul on the Damascus Road. I mean, he is on horseback rolling in to go persecute more Christians and God just smacks him in the mouth with his grace, with his love, and he shows him who he is. The theological term for this is called the effectual calling. The effectual calling of God where, where all of a sudden the Spirit begins, because every salvation begins with the Spirit, right? We are lost and dead in our sin. Read, read the beginning of Romans. There is nothing we can do to be saved apart from the saving grace of, grace of Christ. If we think there's something that we can do, we're, we're not seeing this scripture correctly. We're not seeing God's love correctly either. There's nothing we can do Salvation always begins with the Spirit of God. But, but this effectual calling, the, the first step is that the Spirit begins to woo in even without knowing it. People begin to be convicted of their sin. They begin to be dissatisfied with their way of life, giving themselves to other things. Then they begin to have a little bit of a knowledge of, of Christ. The cross begins to maybe make a, a little bit of sense. It's not this instantaneous understanding. Even with Paul, Paul went out for training in Arabia for, for months And then the, new, the will begins to renew. We begin to want the things that God wants. Not perfectly, right, because we're still sinful, but we begin to want the things that God wants. 
then we begin to be persuaded and enabled to embrace Jesus. At that moment, we accept the gospel freely offered. God saves those who don't know they're searching. And this is Zacchaeus' story. God's grace is a way of breaking down those who know they need it and those who don't. I mean, I have plenty of stories of, of people coming to church and being like, one day we'll talk about, I don't know why the heck I was showing up to this place. You're all nuts. <laughs> but then the Lord just did something. I was, I was strangely attracted. I've also talked with people who, who are, are strangely attracted to other believers. Not physically, right? <laughs> Hopefully. That's not the reason, but, but, but strangely attracted to, there's something different about this person. There's something there. I'll tell you what, I've used this example before, but I have buddies in high school who, who I love and, and I, I do anything for, but um, like I'm 26 years old, right? I have a wife, we have a little baby. I'm kind of, I've been married since I've been 21. I've kind of been taking life that direction ever since then. And my buddies from high school, majority of them, they're still hitting the club every weekend, different lady every weekend, um, doing their thing, trying to make all the money they can to build their empire. And they're not going to think about life seriously uh, in, in the way of settling down with a family or, or even considering eternal things until they're probably 35. And they, trust me, I've heard questions from them that I'm not going to share here. Rich, why are you deciding to live this way? Because you're missing out on this and this and this and this. But here's the thing. I give it to them, trust me. But here's the thing. Every time there is a crisis in their life, there's something that is happening that is severe. Guess who gets the call? The guy who's living in a stupid way. That's not because Rich Dugan is, is a cool dude, right? It's because the Holy Spirit has transformed me. They've seen the way I lived in high school. They, they saw the way that I lived before I, I handed it over to the Lord. They saw what I, I was I was running the same roads with them. There is an attraction, believer. Lord uses you as a change agent for him. Don't miss that. In fact, sometimes when we are, <clears throat> side note, off my notes, no extra charge. Sometimes when we, as believers, when we are saved, sometimes it's good and right for us to, to break away from those who will cause us to enter into the sin that we are so prone to before Christ, even we're prone to after Christ. Sometimes it's good and right for us to break away, right? But one thing that Jesus never called us to is Christian subculture. He wants us to continue to engage the people that may hate God and hate us because we love God and we love the things of God. He doesn't call us to retreat from them. He calls us to confront them, not as idiots, not as people who aren't gonna heed Paul's warning to Timothy that we need to share the gospel with grace and love seasoned with kindness. No, we don't want to be those obnoxious types of Christians. You know what I'm talking about, right? Don't be offended, don't email me. You know what that means. Jesus wasn't obnoxious, but he wants us to confront others with our transformed lives so that they may see the glory of Christ in us. So we are not meant to retreat from the world. We're meant to press into that world. We're meant to press into that world. So Jesus, he heals, he saves. And let me just clarify salvation real quick because sometimes we get it wrong. You know, When it comes to salvation, 2 Corinthians 5 says that we are new creations in Christ. This doesn't mean that we are, God kind of picks us, us, picks us up, cleans us off, kind of like that Toy Story scene where, where that guy comes in and he sews uh, Woody's arm back on, brushes him, you know, and that kind of thing. And um, that, if you guys watch real movies, I'm sorry, I'm still in, into the Disney thing. But, but anyway, like he doesn't just recycle us. He doesn't just clean us up, dust us off, and say, all right, you're better than you once were. He makes us completely new. God doesn't recycle. He renews completely. It's like a, it's like a blanket, right? If it, by the way, I'm in this phase of life now where people give like 
Kate and I blankets for Christmas, right? Which is like, what? You know, who wants a blanket for Christmas? Am I right? Um, but anyway, so we got this blanket for Christmas. If you gave me a blanket, I apologize, all right? But <laughs> I just don't want a blanket or a candle. Or... <laughs> just kidding. I'm not kidding. Um, but this blanket, right? This blanket, it's not like the blanket of life. Jesus isn't just weaving a new thread through it. He's giving us a completely new blanket. Just not for Christmas. He's giving us a completely new life. My friends, Jesus saves. He heals. And the third thing we see here is Jesus transforms. What else, apart from the gospel, makes the heart unselfish? What else, apart from the gospel, gives hope to a blind beggar? Bartimaeus. The blind beggar is now glorifying the Lord, walking around town, seeing people for the first time. And Zacchaeus, the slimy swindler of his time, the tax collector, ends up giving half of what he has to the poor. And he ends up returning what has been taken fourfold. His life is transformed. Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus begin to see the true meaning of life. And others notice this. In fact, I could imagine Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' life is changing. He goes back and, and he gives people back their money and they must question, like, what is this guy trying to do? This guy must be trying something. He has some ulterior motive here. There's something else going on here. Like, people are going to be skeptical when transformation happens. That's what happened with Zacchaeus here. And what's amazing about Zacchaeus, let's think about how just transformed he is. He gives half of what he has to the poor, and then he gives back all that he has stolen fourfold. That leaves him with close to nothing, probably. If anything, it might have nothing, because guess what? He sees that I have all I need in this Jesus. I have all I need in this Christ. My friends, Jesus heals, he saves, he transforms. And, and guess what? Let's zoom out for a moment. He still heals. He still heals, brother. He still saves. And he still transforms. Luke 19.10 is still the truth. He still seeks and he still saves the lost. And believer, we can learn from these two men. Jesus saved two very different people here. Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus couldn't have been more different. Bartimaeus is, is the stinky dude on the side of the road who has nothing. Zacchaeus is the dude who probably lived in a big old place and had a lot. Zacchaeus feared by many. Bartimaeus feared by none. But they did have some things in common. And what they had in common, church, I want us to consider this year together not a big New Year's resolution guy because they're all broken by the 15th, right? But I want us to consider, hey, if we did these things, the Lord would change us individually but also corporately. We're not going at it alone here. I just had, my wife and I had, had dinner with, with Ariel and TJ last night and, and we were talking about, you know, one of, the, one of the bummers of a big church is we just don't know everyone, Right? But we can't, we can't separate ourselves from understanding the fact that, that if we change, we're impacting the whole here. We're not going at it alone here. Well, church, we want to give ourselves, I want to encourage us to give ourselves to these things, not only for the sake of our own personal development. God's not interested in your own personal development. He's interested in his glory. And his glory permeates through, yes, us individually, but through his church globally, corporately. So let us think on that level. Hey, church, let's look at the example that these two men had. Number one, Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, they wondered at the Son of Man. They marveled at the Son of Man. When is the last time we did this? When is the last time we, we turned our gaze to the Lord and marveled at his majesty? That is where things begin to change. 
That is where things begin to change. When we actually look to him, I'm not just talking about singing songs about his majesty. I'm, I'm talking about our hearts full face to the Lord. You know, I grew up in a church, old school United Methodist church, and I sang victory in Jesus a whole lot. My Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. I love me ere, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. I sang these words that were rich and powerful, but I never once turned my eyes to him. If we think tradition will save us, we got it wrong. We must turn to him and we must marvel at him and we must give our whole minds to him because the God of the universe, he sought us, he bought us. And Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, they were amazed by this Jesus. Jared Wilson, an author, says this, if you want to have your imaginations captured by anything other than God and his good news, you will taste and see just how unsatisfying how laden in the belly it is. Apart from Jesus, we are never going to be satisfied. God wants us with our full minds to engage him. Jesus said we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and our mind. I love what Jared says there, capturing our imagination. God wants to capture our imagination. And I want to say here, the Bible is always the place you start to, to see our Lord. But if you, if you find yourself stuck, one of the best books I've ever read that, that encouraged my walk in the Lord, it was before bed reading, right, was Gospel Wakefulness by Jared Wilson. That's where that quote's from. Gospel Wakefulness by Jared Wilson. You want to pick that up. I think it's in our store. I've recommended it to be in our store if not, uh, I could probably get it cheaper on Amazon. Don't tell anybody I said that, but um, there you go. So they wondered at the Son of Man, number one. Number two, they positioned themselves for grace. They placed themselves where the Savior was and met him. Bartimaeus was alongside of the road. He, he probably knew that Jesus was coming into town. Zacchaeus was, climbed up that tree in order so, so he could see Jesus. Our goal, my friends, is to see the Lord, is to know him and enjoy him, positioning ourselves for grace. And you know what? God gives us channels to do this today. God gives us habits that we can, we can put into our life in our normal rhythms, Right? so that we can see his grace. And here's the thing, we can't force his hand, never. Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus couldn't force the Lord's hand. Bartimaeus didn't make Jesus heal him. But we can, as Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards says, lay ourselves in the way of allurement. Lay ourselves in the way of Jesus so that we are enticed by him and his majesty. How do we do this? We pray. We have a God who hears us. We meditate on God's word. We don't just read it like a newspaper. We're just trying to get facts and, and get away from it. We steep in it. We slow down and we steep in it. Hey, New Jersey, slow down. The Lord is in the slowness. He's in the quietness. Like put your phone away for one second. Like ever, I'll tell you what. My office is in the far corner of this building, right? The men's bathroom's on the other side over here, all right? So I need to walk like eight miles to get to the bathroom every time from my office, okay? And every time from my office, I rip out my phone, I see who's texting me, I check my Instagram, that kind of thing. And, and here's the thing. This sounds so stupid, so silly, but I've stopped doing that because there are moments that the Lord wants to capture in my day that I am ruining by not thinking on him as I take that walk. It sounds silly, but where are the moments in your day that you are losing? Where are the moments in your day where you could position yourself for the grace of God? So they wandered at the Son of Man, they positioned themselves for grace, and this is the last one here, friends. For Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, Jesus' opinion was all that mattered. It was all that mattered. Everything else fell by the wayside. The stigma of blindness. Bartimaeus didn't care. He didn't keep quiet. He didn't shut up like he probably normally did, lest he be beat up. 
He shouted, son of man, have mercy on me. He broke through the crowd, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crooked nastiness of a, of a tax collector, he no longer cared about what people thought. People were scoffing at him, but he no longer cared. Tunnel vision on Christ. Hey, church, what if we wondered at the Son of Man? What if we marveled at this Son of Man this year? What if we positioned ourselves for grace, positioned ourselves in front of him? And what if his opinion was all that mattered? Imagine how he could use us. But I want to warn you, I want to warn you that there is another group in this story. There was the group that told Bartimaeus to shut his mouth. There was the group that um, got frustrated that Jesus was meeting at a home, going to a home of a sinner. They didn't like that Jesus was being gracious to people. And we're going to find those people. We're going to run into those people. But just like I said earlier, we don't turn ourselves away from them. We, we turn to them. We show them the compassion that Jesus shows us. We turn to them and we, we love them. We turn to them. We don't care what they say about us because guess what? O only opinion that matters is Jesus's. The only opinion that matters is Jesus's. So let me wrap up with this. I want to talk to two camps. I do this all the time. Unbelievers. I'm not silly enough to think that, that just because everybody came to church today that you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Everybody in this room. I, I'm just not silly enough to think that. Unbelievers, wherever you are at right now, physically, emotionally, wherever you are at, Jesus is seeking you right this second. Right now, Jesus is, is seeking after you. And guess what? You may say, no, Rich, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know who I am. You don't even know what I did a few hours ago last night. I cleaned myself up enough to, to get here. I'll tell you what. You could be as messed up, as broken as the worst person on this earth. And Jesus' grace is bigger than your mess. It's bigger than your mess. And, and I want to continue with, with that not only that, but he is better than the things you're giving your life to. He is better than the stuff you're giving your life to. He will satisfy you. He will, he will give you worth. He will give you purpose. He is more than all of it. We see so much seeking in our own day after other things than Christ. Even, you know, New Year's Eve was just the other day and you see all through Twitter and all through Facebook and all through Instagram, all these people who are, are expecting more in the new year. I'm leaving 2018 behind me. 2019 is gonna be different. I'm gonna do this. New year, new me. All of this baloney. Seeking for renewal. We see examples of, of our seeking in, in those little things. Those are eternal things, church. Don't get mistaken. And if you're not a believer, and if you were looking for 2019 is going to be my year, it'll be your year if you find all that you've ever wanted in Jesus. Like, consider this Christ. Because he will give you that renewal. He will give you what you've longed for. I'm not talking health, wealth, and prosperity, but he'll give you something much better. He'll give you purpose. He'll give you a reason to live. He'll give you an opportunity to not just look for, forward to the next big thing. As believers, we don't just look forward to the next vacation, to the next holiday, to the next big thing, to the next promotion. We have every day, every second purpose in Christ. And let me talk to believers here. I include myself in this. We've heard two stories today. We've heard that Jesus seeks and he saves the lost. Can we live like this is true? Like, can we actually live like this is true? So I'll tell you what, I don't sometimes. I don't a lot. When we live like this isn't true, we drain ourselves of the power that resides within us. Church, this is real. 
we got to stop messing around. He still seeks. He still saves. And his saving power came from the fact that he died on a cross, shed his blood for us, and a few days later he rose from the dead.